I've been getting into making some artwork, which is a personal expression of this conflict between the incredibly old world craft that we practice and the information age. And so I've been carving computer code and things like that, and I'm, I'm playing with, with ideas of intent in, in the message that you're trying to, to convey, and what does it mean, and does it mean anything at all? There's the big question mark of, of what is all of this information that's, that's you know, flying around all the time. We should maybe think about all of these things. And hopefully that's, that's being conveyed through the work. The John Stevens shop here at 29 Thames Street in Newport was founded in 1705 by the Stevens family. A fellow named John Stevens began it then. And he was a mason from, from England. The mortality rate being what it was back then, pretty brutal, they realized that making gravestones was a, a good way to, to make some money. <laughs> so they started making gravestones. And that continued on for six generations of, of the Stevens family. It became a proper monument shop uh, after the 18th century. And then my grandfather bought it in 1927. And he ran the shop until he died in 1956. And then my father took it over uh, in 1963. He ran it for a good long time before I took it over in 1993. So I'm the third generation of my family, the Bensons but nine generations total. No matter how loose I get with it, the practice hand is always somewhere in there. I cannot help but do it. It's, it's, part, of, it's part of what I've been doing for, for 25, 30 years. And the sort of battle between your practice hand and the loose freeform hand is one of the things that interests me most in this newer work that I'm doing. Well, I was born here in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, back in 1964. I grew up here in Newport. I began work here at the shop when I was 15. I always wanted to sort of let loose with my hand calligraphically and see what comes out sort of on the fly in a very, very visceral, freeform way. So I went to school uh, at the State University of New York at Purchase, SUNY Purchase, which is the art school of the SUNY system. A professor of mine there saw some of the stonework that I had done, some of the lettering and the stone carving. She said, oh, if you're really interested in taking over your family business, you've got to go to the School of Design in Basel, Switzerland. I looked into it and I said, yeah, this is definitely the place I gotta go. And I wrote them a letter and said, hey, can you send me some information, uh, application or something? And the head of the school wrote back and said, no, no, come over, we have set up a program for you. Little did I know the guy was a good friend of my dad's. So nepotism was heavily in effect there. And it was, it was a tremendous uh, program. It was incredible. There is a greater appreciation that's, that's slowly coming about for typeface design, um, just because of our interaction with the computer, which is, which is pretty interesting. We do most of our, our lettering calligraphically, so I brush it all by hand, laboriously. And then when people look at that, they say, oh, what's the font? I said, well, it's not really a font, it's, it's calligraphy, it's right out of my hand. In our opinion, the calligraphic form is far more attractive than the typographic form. The typographic form is uh, a little stilted and a little antiseptic and mechanical and doesn't quite have so much of the human hand to it. I really, really love being able to come in and, and lay out any of the, the things that I'm doing, either gravestones or architectural inscriptions, like the big work that we do down in Washington, D.C., like the National World War II Memorial or the Martin Luther King Memorial. It's great to, to get your hands dirty and, you know, hash out some designs and lay some lettering out by hand and, and uh, really, really dive into that process. It's, it's great. I love it on the Martin Luther King Memorial, I spent several months designing a site-specific typeface for the memorial. It's made specifically for carving in a very specific type of granite at a very specific scale. Uh, and then when that was approved, we went on to designing the inscriptions themselves. There were 14 inscriptions total. 
So once we get up on the wall and we, we start pecking away, well, then it's just a matter of, OK, we have 2,225 characters to cut. So I put together a team of guys, and we, we all go down there, people that I trust implicitly. Making a beautifully carved letter, when you're done with it, you finish the final serif, and you look at it, and you go, ah, oh, yes, I've, I've nailed that. That's something that's, that, that's very, very appealing to me. I love that. I'm, I'm pretty uptight about order, and there's something in the process of carving stone where you are making order with these extremely precise marks that I find very, very appealing. I love it. People often say, wow, you must be a really, really patient guy. And I say, no, no. I'm the flip side. I'm, a, I'm so impatient, it's ridiculous. It is a strange combination of, of, of settling down and getting to the, to the very, very disciplined work and my, my high energy um, personality. When you look at the, the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis within the, the craft of the John Stevens shop, conveying the client's message is first and foremost in that act. Looking at the aesthetic is secondary. Whereas with this other work I'm doing, it's a flip of that. So what hits you first is the aesthetic. You go, oh my gosh, what, what is that really is the first thing you say. Is you say, what is that? Because it's not easily legible. I love the play between something that is very, very ethereal, something like a piece of computer code, which is just a little snippet of something that lasts for a microsecond being permanently carved into stone, and the idea that it's there forever. And it's a reflection of this time right now. When I received the MacArthur Fellowship about five years or so ago, it gave me a little time to contemplate some stuff and make some work that I'd always been wanting to make, but I didn't exactly know where that was going to take me. I also did a, a fellowship at Yale at the Yale University Art Gallery, and that was really the jumping off point. And I've just gotten started in this process, and I don't know where it's going to take me. That's another thing that I find extremely exciting about it, because each time I sort of move from one step to the next, I realize, oh, hold on, there's some connections here. And I start making more connections, and I say, hey, this is, this is really interesting. Let me think more about this, and let me make more. And so there's a heavy, heavy play on that idea of recording this, this information age in stone, which could last forever. So I, I like that idea. I'm seeing bits and pieces of, of people not quite understanding what we're up to and not really understanding the merit of the work. You know, I've tried to keep to the standards that my father set and my father certainly kept to the standards that, that his father set. And so this is a very long line of, of very, very rarefied work and it becomes more and more difficult for people to really even understand what we're up to because craft has, has fallen by the wayside so much in this, in this country. Um, and in the Western world in general. So I don't know how that's going to pan out. I don't know, I don't know how the world is going to change and whether or not this old business that's been you know, chugging along here for 311 years will, will have a place in the modern world. We'll have to see. I, I, I just don't know. It's changing dramatically, so we'll see. Things keep changing. You can count on it, right? That's the one thing that's constant, change. 